Oh, hi. My name is Paul Sadler. I'm a um, cardiac anaesthetist and perfusionist in Perth, Western Australia. Um, I'm lucky enough to work at a couple of hospitals where um, the use of near-infrared spectroscopy for cerebral oximetry is uh, allowed routinely for cardiac patients, uh, cardiac surgical patients. And so over the last few years, we've um, gathered a reasonable amount of experience in the pitfalls and, and the benefits of using this technology. My experience is limited to cardiac anesthesia, but I think you know, a lot of our procedures are just sort of vascular procedures, so um, we've got some insight into what you probably see with uh, other forms of anesthesia and surgery. Um, so we'll go through that. Anyway, so the goal is to detect um, cerebral desaturation events. Um, these might be catastrophes or merely um, developing maldistributions of blood flow. Uh, and sometimes I think of the cerebral circulation just as an at-risk circulation, just like the splanchnik or the renal circulation, and the maldistribution in one um, vascular bed may reflect these in the other, or may reflect dysfunction in the other organs as well, and certainly um, you know, cerebral nerves has been used to predict um, renal dysfunction postoperatively. Um, it's also reassuring sometimes when you're not quite sure how well the patient is coping with whatever surgical insult is being dealt um, to see that the cerebral oximetry is relatively normal, that the ultimate end organ monitor indicates adequate organ, uh, adequate oxygen delivery. So. Um, cerebral desaturation events, their incidence varies according to the types of surgery. I mean, if we're doing a um, circulatory arrest with anti-grade cerebral perfusion or without it, I mean, 100% of the time you're going to have a desaturation event. Uh, and so the nurse is useful to, to monitor it as it develops, um, know when to get sufficiently anxious. In routine cardiac surgery, it's been reported that these events occur in about 70% of cases. Um, other types of surgical interventions or even non-surgical um, you might it's been described uh, to be beneficial or at least it has been described to be used in intentional hypotensive anesthesia say in trauma or, or, in, or in surgery um, of course beach chair position surgery where it's very popular uh, and CDEs, cerebral desaturation events, um, have been reported in, say, 25 to 40 percent of cases, which is remarkable. Obviously, if you're, if you're only interested in detecting neurological deficits as a consequence of these, there's an enormous number of false positives. Deficits have been described in 0.004 percent or thereabouts. So, I mean, we know how rare it is um, for someone to end up with a, a neurological deficit after um, beach chair position surgery um, which which doesn't mean it isn't monitoring for it. it just means that to do the research to prove that NIRS is beneficial would require an astronomical number of patients to be enrolled in that particular study uh, other surgical types where these cerebral desaturation events have been uh, observed is um, thoracic surgery major orthopedic surgery Abdominal surgery, particularly when you're putting someone head up, anti trendelenburg And the other sort of niche use for it is in carotid surgery, uh, clamping of a carotid, where it may predict the need for uh, a surgical shunt uh, while you're doing your anastomosis or whatever, endarterectomy. Um, and I think they use uh, a change in oximetry of, 12, of more than 12% to predict that need. In terms of research regard, uh, you know, around cerebral oximetry, there's really three phases of studies. Um, the first phase was showing that cerebral oximetry can detect these desaturation events and that these desaturation events are associated with a poorer outcome um, in patients postoperatively, whether that be um, from postoperative delirium, postoperative neurological dysfunction or renal dysfunction, all those sort of things. So first it was an association. The next thing to show was that once you've detected a desaturation event, that monitoring your cerebral oximetry and then intervening will allow will decrease the time that these abnormal readings uh, will exist for. So, for example, they've done randomised trials in cardiac surgery where um, 
uh, one randomised group, the clinician can see the nurse value and can intervene, and in the other group, they're unaware of the nurse value. In the, in the group where the clinicians can see the nurse value and intervene, the overall time that the patient spends with an abnormal nurse reading is you know, like a third less. Um, the next step is to show that this is translated to um, an improvement in post-operative outcomes, and obviously that requires much larger numbers to show. Um, but there are many of them are scheduled to be reported at the end of this year if they follow the timelines as planned. So um, what is near-infrared spectroscopy? Um, I think of it as pulse oximetry for bypass or when you have non-pulsatile flow, uh, as well as pulsatile flow. Um, it exploits the differing absorption of infrared light by oxy and deoxygen, deoxyhemoglobin. Um, see the graph on the right-hand side at the top. Uh, infrared light can penetrate the skull uh, and, and go into the superficial layers of the frontal cortex. Um, and the use of two diode detector pairs with different spacings in each sensor in, or in each pad on the forehead uh, means that contamination from extracranial blood can be corrected for. The value reported um, is a weighted saturation of venous and arterial blood. The venous blood is 70 to 75 percent of the uh, influence on the number and arterial is 25 to 30 percent. So anything that increases the volume of venous blood in the path of the, of the light um, will cause the reported value to be lower. Anything that increases the volume of, of arterial oxygenated blood uh, will cause the value to be higher. And of course, um, additionally, increasing the hemoglobin concentration in venous blood, sorry, the hemoglobin saturation in venous blood will increase the value or any, any increase in extraction of oxygen by the tissues will reduce it. So normal values are 60 to 80 percent. Uh, an absolute value under 55 percent is considered to be an intervention point. Uh, and a decline from the baseline of 20 percent is also an intervention point. So there's two sort of intervention points. The baseline is usually taken when the patient is awake and sort of normally interactive. Um, Occasionally someone will have values of 40% when they're awake and happily chatting to you and this is important to recognise beforehand so that you don't over-treat the number. The strips are placed on the forehead on each side of the midline line, avoiding uh, the frontal sinus. So you can see the frontal sinus in blue on that skull. The frontal sinus can be very large and, and this is the cause of artefact in some patients. So we tend to put the bis or entropy strips um, just above the eyebrows over the frontal sinus, which gives us a bit of room before the hairline to put um, the cerebral oximetry pads. Um, some patients' foreheads aren't big enough. The monitor seen here um, also has to be visible, obviously. Here we've got rubbish all over it. Um, but both uh, each... Um, hemisphere is indicated uh, individually. They generally move in unison, uh, but this way any asymmetrical movement, whether due to localizing pathology or surgical injury, is immediately uh, obvious and, and, it's, and it's significant. So when they move, when both of them move, you, you wait for a 20% difference, but when one of them moves relative to the other, a, a smaller difference probably um, requires a bit of attention. So this is just a routine cardiac case. I think the oximetry initially increased with hypothermia as you have decreased tissue extraction with reduced metabolism um, and it fell again with rewarming towards the end of bypass so there's nothing uh, abnormal going on here. Induction of anesthesia may result in significant changes in the value. Usually um, it increases as you reduce the cerebral metabolism and increase uh, the inspired oxygen concentration. Um, sometimes it falls and you need to decide whether to reset your baseline or not. Um, I mean, if the patient doesn't have any pathology that's likely to cause a problem, your induction has been just like the other thousands you've done where the patients have done fine, then it's worth keeping in mind what that number was as well as the gold standard which was when they're awake and happy and talking to you.
Um, the frontal sinus, obviously, we've talked about, can cause a problem, and that presumably would cause a very low reading. Uh, it's important to know that you're really only monitoring the frontal um, lobes, uh, although there is, you know, this is meant to correlate with the middle cerebral artery blood flow um, when they've studied that. And uh, well, the other thing is that when you do have a low value, it doesn't tell you what the cause is. It could be any number of the, the factors you know, listed here, the eight factors that will reduce your cerebral oxygenation values, or it could just be one of these artefacts. For us in um, cardiac surgery, particularly with perfusion, the device is, is very useful for catastrophe detection. Um, this has been noted in the literature, and, and there was an example here where um, there was a bilateral desaturation in the nerves value from 45% to 19%, and that coincided with decannulation of the superior vena cava. Um, and, and due to this being detected and you know, notified to the surgeon, it was recognised that they forgot to remove the snare, um, resulting in obstruction of venous drainage from the brain. Um, so you can see how that would have been catastrophic if not detected. This, this one's an example of asymmetrical changes, um, which are very concerning, even if they're less extreme. Um, in this example, the values on the left, we have a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass where the arterial cannula is in, in the leg and blood flows retrograde up the aorta to the brain. Um, the cross clamp is removed where there is a little spike halfway along in the time axis. And from that point on, the right frontal hemisphere oxygenation falls compared to the left. Uh, which inc improves slightly. Um, so what's happened, or what's happening, is that when the cross clamp comes off, the heart can start contracting and ejecting again, but the lungs aren't on, they're not ventilated. So the blood ejected um, is deoxygenated, um, and essentially you have two pumps from either end of the aorta, the heart pumping uh, deoxygenated blood um, from the top down, and the uh, heart-lung machine pumping oxygenated blood from the femoral artery up towards the brain. So they meet somewhere in the middle. Um, the blood from the heart goes straight down the right denominate artery and the right carotid. So that's why the value in the right side of the brain for oxygenation is lower than on the left. Um, and the solution was just to turn on the lungs, which we did, and it, and it solved everything. But this wouldn't have been recognised without, um, without nerves. And this is called um, Harlequin syndrome or north-south syndrome. Harlequin syndrome because the upper body goes blue and the lower body is nice and pink. Um, and it's more, more widely described with uh, ECMO. And this is an example of how we can improve the, um, the nerves value. Uh, and in this example, when it dropped to an interven intervention level, we start, and that was because we'd hemodiluted the patient by going on to bypass. Um, so over the next hour, we hemoconcentrated the patient, and as you know, we took fluid off and the hemoglobin concentration increased gradually, you can see that the oxygen carrying capacity improved and the nerves value improved. Another interesting example is this one, where sort of waves in the oximetry values are seen. Each dip occurs every 20 minutes, and this coincides exactly with when we're giving cardioplegia, um, which passes to the, um, to the pump and causes whole body vasodilatation and hypotension briefly. Finally, um, there are many algorithms for managing a, a low nerves value um, or cerebral deoxygenation event. This one's modified from Denault and colleagues. Um, a better one comes from the perfusion crisis manual, which I wrote. But essentially, you can, you can manipulate blood pressure, carbon dioxide concentration, hemoglobin concentration, um, venous drainage, which you know, means all kinds of things like making sure that the head's in a neutral position. Um, you can modify temperature, etc. So we use um, cerebral oximetry or near infrared spectroscopy primarily for catastrophe detection, particularly on bypass. Um, but also to um, allow us to identify and treat regional maldistribution in blood flow um, at, for the uh, at-risk vascular beds. Uh, it's also, for us, it's pulse oximetry for bypass um, because we, you know, if we've got reasonable um, cerebral oximetry values, we know that 
first of all, the flows that we're running on the pump are adequate, the cannulation's adequate, we're oxygenating the blood. Um, and so that's very reassuring, particularly if there's any uh, crisis occurring. Um, the other important thing, I mean, we use it routinely and, and being familiar with uh, the technology and knowing when you can ignore potentially an abnormal reading will prevent you from over-treating things when you, um, when you do have artefacts or, or, or when you can anticipate that there will be an abnormal value, which doesn't necessarily mean that there is a catastrophe or, or that, that you have, hyper, that you have um, maldistribution of vulnerable tissue beds. But yes, for us it's, it's pulse, ox pulse oximetry for bypass. And we would feel uncomfortable, uh, really uncomfortable um, conducting uh, cardiac surgery without it. Um, but yeah, thanks very much.